The coronavirus continues to spread as Congress is prepared to pass a $2 trillion stimulus package. What's the economic forecast and when can America get back to work? Chief Economic Advisor to the President, Larry Kudlow, is here with an update. EWTN's Home Diocese has a new leader. Bishop Designate Stephen Reka joins us to share his vision for the Diocese of Birmingham and much more in an exclusive. And one U.S. bishop took to the streets this week, literally in response to the pandemic. Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas, shows us how he's shepherding his flock in these strange times. And Virginia Parish priest Father Bjorn Lundberg tells us how he and his peers are using innovative approaches to reach their parishioners. The National Catholic Register's Edward Penton reports from Rome. All of that and much more the world over begins right now. From New Orleans tonight, a warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We're happy to be with you as this global confinement continues. We'll have news, inspiration, and a lot more in the hour ahead. Larry Kudlow, Bishop Stephen Reka, and Joseph Strickland, as well as Father Bjorn Lundberg and Edward Penton are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover, but first, some news. The U.S. Congress is putting the finishing touches on a two trillion-dollar economic stimulus package in response to the coronavirus. The thousand-page bill contains aid for regular Americans as well as small and large businesses, including airlines and manufacturing. The package passed through the Senate in a bipartisan vote of 96 to 0. It is set for a vote in the House on March 27th. The bill is not without several controversial and questionable provisions, which I will get to with my first guest tonight. Joining me now to unpack Congress's $2 trillion stimulus package and the forecast for the U.S. economy as we make our way through this pandemic is the director of the National Economic Council under President Trump. Please welcome back to the program Larry Kudlow who joins us from the White House. Larry, thanks for being with us. I want to begin with a debate over when to reopen this economy. The president has said he'd like to see us out of this quarantine, or many of us, by Easter. Watch. I would say by Easter we'll have uh, a recommendation, and maybe before Easter. But our country wants to get back to work. Larry, is Easter a realistic goal? What's the right balance here? Well, look, uh, first of all, it's my view, it's a matter of leadership. And it's an aspirational target, meaning it could be flexible. We're working towards it. Uh, we're going through a lot of uh, data analysis. We're gathering uh, data banks and doing our empirical work. And we want to see which areas. You know, it's, it's the term is stratification, Raymond. You want to look at mm -hmm. uh, demographic groups, okay, who's at risk and who's not. You want to look at what the testing scores show, that's very important. You want to look for hot spots versus non-hot spots, that's very important. You want to look at, uh, you know, crowds versus non-crowds, social distancing mm -hmm. to what degree. So the term for that is stratification. We're looking at everything. I, I think the president is actually right. He's signaling the country we want to reopen wherever we can reopen because, look, this, the health and safety of the American people comes first. But remember, mm -hmm. economic health and economic security goes hand in hand yeah. with health security. So to the extent that we can begin to rebalance and merge the two, we will. I think of it as a flexible target and an aspirational target. But I will tell you this, yeah. we are working toward that. We are working toward something now, Larry, that, like that. You're on that coronavirus task force. Yes. I know some of the uh, consultants there would like to shut down the economy for six months because they're only looking at the stress this could put on hospitals. Is that reasonable and acceptable to you? Well, look, I'm not going to uh, second guess. We have the most brilliant health specialists and scientists uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. They're either working full time or they're working part time or on the phone. I am mm -hmm. not going to second guess them. What I am going to say is that we have to be concerned with whatever balance can be reached. Now, 
This is, we are not going to sacrifice health and health safety. We are not. But right. many people, for example, Raymond, there are whole states out there that have virtually no uh, infection cases. So mm -hmm. that might qualify as one of those, remember, I, uh, stratification, that might show one of the right. stratas or one of the demographics or one of the geographics that work. We, we look, some places have a shortage of hospital space. Some places, places have a surplus of hospital space. We would look at right. that as well. But I'm not going to second guess the opinion of our health specialists because they've done a fabulous job and we are doing yeah. what we have to do to try and deal with this. And, and again, Raymond, prayerfully, and I mean this prayerfully, this is going to mm -hmm. be a question of weeks at most months but it is not a question of years. That's what makes this uh, difficult situation a little less difficult, and people need to have some faith yeah. here. Okay. Uh, I, I want to... There's a letter the president released to the governors of the nation, and in it he says uh, the coronavirus task force and the administration is going to be identifying low-risk, middle-risk, and high-risk counties around the country right. so that the local governors can decide. It looks like what he's proposing is a rolling reopening of this economy, as you said, based on danger, threat, and infection rate in a given locality. Is that the vision that I'm hearing here? Yes, more or less, that's exactly right. That's this uh, uh, stratification business. Yeah, I mean, different places have different stories, some better, some worse, and so forth and so on, but that's mm -hmm. exactly right. And I I want to say, in addition, when you make an economic decision like this, in addition to consulting the health specialists, which is essential, mm -hmm. essential, we're not going to buck their right. advice, it's important to go to the state executives, the governors, um, who have been terrific. I mean, you've got my yeah. friend Andrew Cuomo in California, Gavin News, I mean, in New York, Gavin Newsom in California, we're all working together in this, uh, we're all in a unity mode here. Uh, but we will, obviously, when you go county by county, you're talking about state jurisdictions. So that'll be a key right. part of it. Okay. Congress and the White House have come to an agreement on this $2 trillion stimulus package. $2 trillion, Larry. That's a big number. Now, you've called it the single largest Main Street assistance program in the history of the U.S. But this package dwarfs the $800 billion stimulus package passed in 2008 during the financial crisis. Does the price tag and the associated debt concern you, Larry? No, it does not. Look, it doesn't. Um, it does not. The. Um it doesn't because we've never had a situation like this before. We've never had mm -hmm. a virus, an epidemic that had taken such a large economic toll. Remember, 2008 was completely different than what we're living through in 2020. 2008 mm -hmm. was essentially uh, a systemic collapse of the banking system. There are lots of reasons right. for that. We don't have time to go into it. No, this no. has nothing to do with the collapse of the banking system. By the way, it doesn't have anything to do with the collapse of the economy. The economy was right. roaring coming into this year, roaring in January and February. Uh, it has to do with this virus. And we have to learn what it is, how to defeat it. You know, we're looking at, uh, at uh, measures, medicines, and so forth to deal with it. So yeah. these numbers have to be proportionate to the threat and the okay. impact on the economy. We've never had anything like this. But, Raymond, I, I don't, you know, I don't like deficit spending any more than the next person, but the reality is interest rates are mm -hmm. so low, 30, 40 yep. basis points, for heaven's sakes. If you have to borrow in order to invest into workers and families who are getting the bulk mm -hmm. of our assistance and small businesses right. who are getting the other bulk of the assistance, that's a good investment. And again, this is a matter of weeks and months, not years. So okay. I, I think that's I a very good trade-off. Let's dive into this stimulus package. It is meant to deliver financial support to businesses forced to shut their doors, relief to American families and hospitals that have to respond rapidly to this coronavirus. The main points of the bill are the following. $250 billion set aside for direct payments to individuals and families, $350 billion to small businesses in loans, $250 billion to unemployment insurance benefits, $500 billion in loans for distressed companies, and $150 billion plus for the health care system. Individuals who earn $75,000 or less, Larry, would get direct payments of $1,200 each, while married couples earning $150,000 get about $2,400 uh, $2, uh, and an additional $500 per child. 
When can those Americans expect to see their checks? Uh, we're working hard at it. I think the individual checks, Raymond, which will be uh, distributed by the IRS, um, probably in a week or two. Let's call it just a few short weeks. The unemployment. Okay. And by the way, and here's an important point: some people have missed it. Um, uh, those checks go out to kind of help families get through the basic essentials, particularly if you're shut in, right? You, you may still have a job, mm -hmm. but you're shut in, you're not working. So that's a bridge. Those checks are a bridge to the more difficult story, which is unemployment benefits, which might take a few mm -hmm. weeks longer. So there's a bridge there. But you're quite right. It's $500 billion to individuals wow. and families, about $350 billion to small business. Don't forget, you know, you can't have a good job unless you have a good business, a healthy business to hire yep. you. So yep. we have yep. gone through a business payroll tax. We've gone through uh, loan guarantees to small businesses, up to, I think, 500 mm -hmm. or so employees. We're going to take down their expenses. We're going to make up for lost revenues. These are the small business. And incidentally, one other thing, you mentioned the $500 billion. Now, that's the Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. Just think of it as an emergency right. fund. That's what gives mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve tremendous firepower, yes, to help distressed industries, but also the Fed is helping everybody here. I mean, it's going to be about $4 mm. trillion dollars probably when it's said and done. The Fed is helping the financial markets to keep stability because there's a bit of and a liquidity. credit crunch that's developed. Liquidity, thank you. You're exactly on target. They're going to be helping credit card loans, student loans, small business loans, municipal mm -hmm. bond offerings by states and localities that need some help. So the Fed assistance in the form of loans, backed up by the Treasury guarantees, will cover the, virtually the entire economy. And again, the goal here... Mm -hmm is to try to stabilize the economy and the financial markets as best we can while we work through what I hope, and again, I say this prayerfully, are the last yeah. weeks of the worst of the virus. That's our goal. Okay. And then we should come back very, very strong in the back end of the year. Now, Larry, according to reports, one of the sticking points for Democrats in passing this stimulus package was a fight over abortion providers like Planned Parenthood. Democrats wanted abortion providers to be eligible for aid under the small business portion of this bill. Uh, language has since been inserted barring nonprofits for, that receive Medicaid funding, which included Planned Parenthood. What do you make of the last-minute attempts here to try to load this bill with pork, $25 million for the Kennedy Center, $75 million for the National Endowment for the Humanities. I mean, th th this has nothing to do with the coronavirus, Larry. Well, that's true. Look, um, Raymond, I'm going to stay away. Y you know that I'm a strong pro-life person, um, defending mm. the life of the unborn, have been mm -hmm. for decades and decades and decades. Uh, so that's my personal view, remains my personal view. I'm going to stay away from the politics of this thing. I, I just want to okay. see the House vote as quickly as possible so we can get everything charged up and get the disbursement procedures going, get through the mechanics, get through the computer stuff, so folks can begin to get some assistance to keep them going during these next few weeks and months. That, that's the key point. The politics are the politics. We got the bill. It was a heck of a thing. It's $2.2 trillion of spending assistance. It's another $4 trillion of Fed assistance. That's over $6 trillion, Raymond. That's almost one-third of the entire U.S. economy. Those are the resources we are devoting to try to keep the economic side alive until we can uh, finally conquer the virus. Larry Kudlow, we will leave it there. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much, Raymond. Appreciate it. And Bishop-designate of Birmingham, Stephen Reka, is up next. But first, a little more news to share with you. The Archdiocese of New Orleans announced this week that Archbishop Gregory Amond has tested positive for the coronavirus. According to a statement, the 70-year-old Amond had recently exhibited a mild fever and, out of an abundance of caution, was tested. Archbishop Amond is now self-quarantined, but will remain active online via Facebook and the Archdiocesan website while he recovers. Amond is the first U.S. Catholic bishop to confirm he's contracted the coronavirus. And last week, our friend and papal posse member, Father Gerald Murray, joined us. He was in self-quarantine after exposure to someone infected with COVID-19. 
Many of you expressed your concern about Father's condition over the week. I'm happy to report Father Murray is doing well. He has shown no symptoms of the coronavirus, and he's ended his quarantine. We'll continue to keep him in our prayers, however, and all those suffering in New York and around the world. On a more serious note, former president of EWTN News, Dan Burke, is in intensive care after having tested positive for the coronavirus. Dan had been on a ventilator. However, he seems to be showing signs of improvement. His wife, Stephanie, has also contracted the virus. Please keep Dan and Stephanie Burke in your prayers. Terrible happening everywhere. Joining me now is the bishop of the Diocese of Gaylord, Michigan. But on June 23rd, he'll be installed as the new shepherd of the Diocese of Birmingham, Alabama, which, as most of you know, is the home diocese to EWTN. He's here to talk about his new assignment and his vision going forward. Please welcome Bishop-designate Stephen Reka. Bishop, first of all, congratulations on your appointment. I know uh, our friends in Birmingham are very excited. Uh, this is a, a boon at a very difficult moment, I think, for the people of Birmingham. So uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Raymond. It's a delight to be with you this afternoon. Bishop Reka, you are a canon lawyer trained in Rome. You were also superior yes. at the North American College's uh, graduate school and spiritual director there. How did those yeah. experiences in both the canon law and spiritual direction prepare you for this latest assignment? Oh, my. Uh, well, uh, I think the re really unique aspect of it was uh, really bringing together a group of priests. We had about 70 to 80 priests at Casa Santa Maria, all studying in various mm -hmm. disciplines. Uh, at the various uh, universities and institutes in Rome. And so to be able to uh, have 70 priests, it was like I was already a bishop, you know, organizing these 70 guys to get to where they needed to go. Uh, but I found it to be very a very unique experience because many of these guys came, and, and it was true for myself when I was first uh, a priest there in 1988. And we had this whole sense of that priesthood was all about doing something. I was doing ministry. And then you get there and nobody's calling you, nobody's asking for appointments, and you're, you're quiet and studying and doing your work there. And so it became a whole different reality of just being a priest and what that meant and how that complements the, the doing. So I think in a large part, that was a tremendous growth period for a lot of priests into a, a maturing their understanding of what priesthood mm -hmm. is. Uh, and mm -hmm. that the, the two complement each other so beautifully uh, that I am a priest, whether I am doing the things that I, that priests and parishes typically do, or I am a priest if I am just by myself, uh, and that's who I am, and that's how I live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk for a moment about your current post. Uh, you're the, the ordinary in Gaylord, Michigan. Uh, you'll yes. be making a move uh, in the middle of this global pandemic. This is an odd yes. time. Uh, indeed, it your sure installation is going to be delayed because of it. What do That's you right. see as the what do you see, Bishop, as the missing element in evangelization at this moment that you'd like to bring to your new diocese of Birmingham? Well, I don't know if it's a missing element. There are a lot of things that are going on, uh, especially with the advancement of a lot of social media right now. Mm -hmm. But I think the heart of it really still is Christ. Christ is the center, as, as Saint, that book St. John Paul II said, of, of our history and of our time. And really, we go back to what the, what we find and read in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel when and John and Andrew approached John the Baptist and Christ was going by. And the first word that he tells them is, look. And I think part mm -hmm. of the job that we have as a priest or as a bishop is to say, look, there is the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And there is the beginning of where our life begins to change. So our whole mm -hmm. focus in ministry, I think, and in evangelization is always has to be, look, at Christ. Look at Christ. And he's there. And he's inviting us, yeah. asking us, what is no, it no. that you want? Yeah. yeah. Bishop Reka, you are a devotee of Monsignor Luigi Giussani and his Communion yeah. and Liberation Movement. Uh, you have said it was his educational method that attracted you to his writings. What is it about mm -hmm. that educational method that shaped your own ministry and drew you to Giussani's writings and approach? Uh, part of it was an instruction, uh, certainly the encounter of Christ that leads to freedom, and that was the proposal that mm -hmm. has been given to us. Uh, that has been echoed by John Paul II, it's been echoed by, by Pope mm -hmm. Benedict, and it's been re-echoed again by Pope Francis, and how significant that method has been 
in educating our freedom, uh, freedom to uh, encounter Christ and to encounter Christ in those that we meet day by day. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the whole meaning of life, uh, he would say, that the whole meaning of human, the human journey lies in its destination, and the destination is present not only in the actual moment that the journey ends, but along each step of the way. And I, I find that each step of the way, we find a bit of that divine, a bit of that mystery, a bit of that wonder still making and reaching out to us to attract us to itself. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I read your address about Jasani, uh, it, it spoke of the encounter with a person, the encounter with an yeah. event, and that person is Jesus Christ. And yeah, I kept thinking of Mother correct. Angelica, you know, who, sure. who sort of exemplified it for me, you know, someone passionately in love with Christ um, as right. a living person whom she served with no reserve, just with total Absolutely. abandonment. Now, Correct. the Diocese of Birmingham that you are going to be leading very shortly has a relatively yeah. small Catholic population, 105,000 out of a total of 3 million. But with EWTN base there, it is a diocese with enormous reach. Uh, now, I know you've had Catholic radio in both Lansing and Gaylord. How right. familiar are you with EWTN, and how do you see the collaboration between the diocese and EWTN going forward in the days ahead? Uh, Raymond, that's, uh, uh, you're right. We did have radio here, and that was uh, not mm -hmm. part of the diocese, but certainly a collaborative part of us. And it, it, mm -hmm. it sort of is a complementary aspect uh, that, that we have to work together for the same mission. And I, that reach, I think that EWTN, of course, has this, is so dynamic and so powerful. Uh, and I, to be honest, I don't know anything about how it relates to the Diocese of Birmingham. And because I've never been to Alabama, I've never been to Birmingham. Yeah. So this will all be new for me to try to discover and understand. Uh, and I think one of the key points in all of this is perhaps what I learned when I was in kindergarten or first grade and you were trying to cross the road and, you know, uh -huh. sister or whoever was leading you across it, stop, look, and listen. So part of what I have to do is get down there and quiet my mind and then look and listen to see what's going on and see how that can be nourished and developed. Because I think there's some tremendous things that can happen because of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know the, my my confreres are looking forward to introducing you to the network and the and the work of the network in the days ahead. So we'll certainly do that. Before I let you I go, Bishop, uh, G given this pandemic and the, the temporary public confinement of the faith, as well as the lingering effects of the abuse crisis, are you worried that this could present the church with an additional obstacle to drawing and retaining believers, the faithful? It certainly has that prospect. And what I have reminded our people up here, and certainly the priests, is just because the public celebration of Mass is is being suspended for a period of time doesn't mean that our discipleship is. So our priests and, mm -hmm. and our pastoral administrators and others have been extremely creative in trying to reach out to people and, and using social media for the celebration of Mass, or, or the churches are open where people can come and pray, uh, being available for the sacrament of penance, uh, still going to the hospitals uh, to anoint. And so they are still mm -hmm. actively engaged, and, and they've been doing these kinds of create, creative things to still do ministry, but perhaps in a different way. And one of the things mm -hmm. I think that is really significant in, in doing this is that they are indeed zealous for souls. They want to have that contact, even though we're talking about this sort of paradoxical or ironic uh, concept of social mm -hmm. distancing, you know, social kind of being together, yeah. but distancing, keeping us apart. Uh, and they're yeah. trying to bring that together to make sense for their people. Yeah, well, Bishop Stephen Reka, I, I wish you the best in your new role as the Bishop of thank Birmingham, you. Alabama. We will certainly be in touch in the days ahead, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Raymond. Delight to be with you today. Speaking of bishops, my next guest took to the streets of his diocese this week to bless his people in the midst of this pandemic. Here to tell us the steps he's taking to lead in these unusual times of sacrifice and uncertainty is the Bishop of Tyler, Texas, Bishop Joseph Strickland. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Thanks, Raymond. Glad to be with now, you again. A couple of weeks ago, you called on every Catholic priest in your diocese to lead a simple Eucharistic procession around the local parish church before the Feast of St. Joseph uh, as a way to fight the coronavirus. 
What was the reaction of your priests and the response from parishioners, and what was the idea here? Well, the reaction was very positive. The priests and the people really appreciated it. And really, Raymond, uh, in these amazing times, very troubling, but also amazing good things happening. The, I think the, the truth of Christ is breaking forth in all kinds of ways. And you may know, uh, in our small diocese, I had asked for this to be a year of the Eucharist. And so that, it definitely wasn't on my plan to, to ask for that before the coronavirus began to infect everything, literally. But um, that was the motivation. He's really there. And I've been blessed with a, a book uh, called Insinu Yesu, that I'm sure people are not paying attention to. Probably a lot of priests and bishops are saying, oh, that doesn't make sense. Or It's been transformational to me. Um, and I, I had been really focusing on praying in, before the Blessed Sacrament, either exposed or in the tabernacle, uh, for a long time, really, especially since I've been bishop. It's, it's almost like I've felt the, <laughs> the Holy Spirit just sort of prodding me along. And uh, so that's really the motivation. I just said, we need to let people, and this diocese is a real overestimate would say we're 10% Catholic. We're probably between mm -hmm. five and 8% Catholic. Tyler may, mm -hmm. you know, tickle 10%. So we're not the majority, but um, yeah. my focus and what I've been trying to encourage our staff to do is We've got 1.5 million souls, children of God in this diocese. I'm the shepherd of all of them. Christ didn't say, well, it's only for the Catholic club. It's for everyone. And many of the people, uh, I mean, <laughs> they'll say some pretty negative things about the Catholic faith. But I think we take that with grace. When you know the truth, when you have the truth, it makes you peaceful and loving and calm and joyful. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I just wanted to share that with mainly my people. Uh, what I did as we were there with the deacon and one of the acolytes, um, well, that I, I segued to the intersection. I, I'm sure you're aware of that also. Yeah, standing yeah. Standing well, at the major I, I, intersection. We'll put, of town. We have pictures of this, which we're putting up, and, and you held the Blessed Sacrament with the deacon there. Um, how did the people respond to this, the presence of the Blessed Sacrament there in the midst of them? I guess you're bringing the Eucharist to the people who can't come to the Eucharist. That's basically my idea, Raymond. And the people have been very uh, appreciative, uh, Catholics and non-Catholics. I haven't gotten any negatives about it. I'm sure a lot of people didn't even mm. understand what this guy in the funny clothes doing. Um, <laughs> but what I did, and what I did when we, because when I asked the priest, I try to do the same thing that I asked the priest and not ask them to do things that I don't do as bishop. But when I asked for the simple procession, I did that at our cathedral, and I did that at the chapel, that's sort of an auxiliary chapel here in Tyler, mm -hmm. to the cathedral. Um, and I walked around and basically faced north, south, east, and west, and prayed for God's blessing, holding his son in the form of consecrated bread, his body and blood, soul and divinity. That's our faith. That's what the catechism says. I held him up and said, Lord, bless all to the east, bless all to the north, bless all to the west, bless all to the south. Um, just praying spontaneously mm -hmm. that the Lord is in our midst. Um, I loved it. The, the, the last time I was able to have Mass, uh, it was a smaller crowd because we were already beginning to tell people right. 60 and above, you should probably stay home, and all of that was already happening. Mm -hmm. But I love that that first reading from Exodus. Is the, the Lord in our midst or not? That was the cry yeah. of the people of Israel. And what I tried yeah. to focus on in that holiday, yes, he's here. He really is here. I believe that. And I think as Catholics, the, we all know, many Catholics say, oh, I don't really believe that. It's just a symbol. Certainly, that's what non-Catholics believe. But mm -hmm. I, if I'm the last person on earth, I believe it. I believe it. Well, this is and what the I'm Catholic Church teaches. And I'm willing to do what and, I can to, to make it, share it with others. We need his strength more than ever.
It is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you've encouraged your fellow bishops to do the same, to bring the Blessed Sacrament, yeah. which the Church has always taught is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in that host. That's what happens in transubstantiation. Uh, what's been the response to, from fellow bishops? Um, pretty much, I, I've really heard, I haven't heard of another bishop that's done it. I hope some have, that, mm. at least not in this country. There may have been a couple in other countries. Yes. Um, and yeah. certainly, I, I, I make these suggestions that probably think, was like, this guy's really crazy, but I think I would love to see it across the world, every bishop out mm -hmm. there, and I intend to. And, and let me say, I think it's very important, because I've gotten a lot of pushback from even priests and people in the diocese saying, oh, how can mm. you keep us from communion and all that? And it is painful, mm -hmm. but I yeah. think the sheltering in place, we're surrounded now in Smith County by, uh, in here in East Texas, by counties that are saying shelter in place. Governor Abbott of Texas has said regions need to handle this according to what's going on where they are. Some of mm -hmm. our counties don't have a single case. I think right. Smith County has a number of cases now. Some counties have mm -hmm. one case. We need to deal yeah. with, I think the principle of subsidiarity, it's my new word for all of this because mm -hmm. we've yeah. lost it really with the church. We have these huge organizations, this mega church that you know, is, is controlling everything. And that's not what Christ gave us. He gave us successors no. of the apostles. I have no authority. As soon as you leave the borders of the 33 counties, I have no authority. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. I don't want any more than I've got. But I'm yeah, responsible people, for the people in these yeah. counties. Well, and this seems to be what the federal response is morphing into, too, a case-by-case, county-by-county approach to dealing with this virus, which it seems to me is prudent. Uh, New York needn't do what, you know, a county next to you or your county is doing, because the yeah. situation is very different. The density is different. Very, You're dealing with a totally different situation. That's one of the blessings there. for us. We're a very rural diocese, and, and I think mm -hmm. the rural communities, I mean, the megacities have run the world, yeah. and they're being humbled, and certainly we pray for every person, everyone, every individual is a child of God. We've had the first death to the coronavirus here in Smith County. It's sad, mm -hmm. and, and I specifically don't want to mention the age of the person because they're a child of God from conception to natural death. We need to hold them sacred, and there are already rumblings that well, elderly, they, they need to just shuffle off the globe and make room for the younger. That's not God's mm. teaching to us. And, no. and I think we've no. got to fight those battles also to be very clear that mm -hmm. as hospitals have limited resources, I would hope and pray that they can be blind to age, blind to any kind of disabilities, look at is their heart healthy, are their lungs healthy, mm -hmm. are all their organ systems working, and let that be the measurement. Involve the doctors, absolutely. They're the experts. Involve the families. Let them mm -hmm. have a voice. And involve, I mean, hopefully the laws are not draconian and not allowing some of those appropriate voices. Here in Texas, yeah. we have those challenges. A lot of places do. Yeah. So I think sure. we, we really need to listen to God's word, trust in his love and mercy. And as I've asked people to do, I... <laughs> I went to confession. I go to confession often, but I went to confession immediately thinking, I need all the grace I can get to deal with this. Yeah. And I'm so glad we all that on yeah. Tuesday we of do. last week when things were going crazy, and it's been crazy ever since, I went to confession, and I'm a sinner. I need to repent. That's the truth of all of us. And yeah, you know, I, I think that there's and great you've asked, joy. And you've had, before I run gospel. out of time, Bishop, you, you've asked for repentance during this period. You think we all need to get on our knees uh, during this moment? Yeah, I believe. I said that to the world, which is like, who am I to speak to the world through a tweet? But if anybody's listening, we're all children of God if we believe what we teach as Catholics. And as I've said before, do we believe or not? And many don't. I mean, that's just the conclusion. Many really don't believe well, in the real presence. But this is or a moment. A lot of things. 
this is a moment when every, all the distractions are sort of taken away. It is a moment to focus on your mortality, the meaning of life, the people and, and, uh, that you love most, and why we're here. It, it, it's a moment for that reflection that I think is being imposed on people, whether they wanted it or not. Uh, let me, bef before I let you go, uh, Father Z, the popular blogger, has asked bishops to uh, request that their priests celebrate an additional votive mass to combat this virus. Your thoughts on that uh, idea, additional votive masses? I actually did that. I actually asked the priest, and I'm sure some of them said, why is he doing that? But I asked the priest when I initially put out some directives. Our priests have been wonderful, but I put out some, uh, I asked them to celebrate two masses a day. And it, you know, honestly, it's a little odd to celebrate mass all by yourself. I mean, especially in this context, I mean, we do it as priests all the time, but to know that you really have to be by yourself or to maybe just have mm -hmm. one person there as reader or something. Yeah. Um, but I asked the priest to offer specifically their mass for the people, for the intentions of the people. And you know, hopefully mm -hmm. they're continuing to use those intentions that people offer a Mass for, that's part of our Catholic tradition, continue with those, but celebrate an additional Mass specifically to end the coronavirus, to protect us mm. from this Seems wise. contagion. Yeah. And Perfect. again, if we Bishop, believe that Bishop, the Mass is what it is, we have to offer it. We have to believe right. whether anyone's there or not, Christ is there, and His priest mm. is celebrating it. That should bring Bishop joy Strickland. and hope to everyone. I, I agree. I thank you for your witness. I thank you for your time. I'm out of time. Thank you so much. We'll check in with you in the days ahead. Okay. God bless you. As we've been discussing, the corona pandemic has affected all aspects of life, and it's been particularly hurtful to Catholics uh, in the disruption of the sacraments. Creative solutions have come not only from bishops, but also from parish priests. Here with me now to discuss the innovative ways he and his brother priests are employing to minister to their parishioners, and beyond is the pastor of Sacred Heart of Jesus Catholic Church in Winchester, Virginia, Father Bjorn Lundberg. Father, thanks for being with us. Uh, what's been the biggest challenge for you as a parish priest, contending with this coronavirus and the precautions you have to take? Well, it's a bit analogous to a basketball team. The coach exists for the team, not the team for the coach, but you work together. Mm -hmm. And right mm -hmm. now, I look at an empty church. We have people praying. But we're digitally connecting with people, which is great, but it's just trying to figure out how you can do whatever you can to connect with people, get them confession or the sacraments we can provide, but also do streaming and digital things on Facebook Live and different stuff. People mm -hmm. really appreciate it, but it's just weird to be isolated. Yeah, well, I think we're all feeling that. Now, you're keeping the doors of your church open and people can still come and pray so long as they stick to the rules of social distancing. Uh, as you said, you're offering online services. How have your parishioners responded to the changes? Are they disgusted with it or are they tuning in? Well, there's people, who, uh, people yearn for the sacrament, so people are hurting and that's understandable. Mm -hmm. The feedback has been surprisingly very good because Bishop Burbage asked us to keep our churches open. So we have 25 years of perpetual adoration in our parish. So we have adoration day mm -hmm. and night. During the day, it's in the sanctuary so you can social distance and spread out. And we have to follow the rules of being less than 10 people in the church. And then at night, it's in our mm -hmm. chapel, but that's only usually like a couple people. And then we have drive through confessions and drive in adoration during that time. Wow. And people have really loved it. And we've done streaming masses okay, tell me about, and streaming holy out. Tell me, about, tell me about the drive in adoration. What does that mean? We have pictures of it. Yes. Well, we have a window um, in our chapel, in our rectory. So that people can drive in their cars, they don't get out of their car, and they pull up, and they can look at our Lord and adore Him while praying. And sorry to be cheesy, but our campus is a bit like a Chick-fil-A drive setup. So you come in, you circle around the property, and you go back. And so when they come in, when we're having confessions, they pull up, and we have a staff set up, organize how they wait in a queue in their cars. And then we have glassed-in entrance areas to our gym and our school lobby. And so people come mm. in, the doors are open, there's a screen, they can go to confession, they can leave, and there's the distancing. But then if they're going mm. to confession or not, they can still drive and go to adoration, too. And they love it. They really love it. 
Wow. Well, in Italy, a priest uh, did something similar. Um, but, uh, you know, there, I think everybody's trying to, to find a way to engage. And there was a priest, he tried to say a mass, and as he started, right. he neglected to turn the filters off on his phone, and this right. is what happened. Buonasera. Ci ritroviamo insieme per pregare, io in chiesa e voi a casa. Oggi è venerdì di Quaresima e vogliamo pregare con la Via Crucis. Poor guy. Poor guy. I feel bad for him. I felt so bad for him. Totally. I know, and, it's, and of course, the thing went viral. So we're not making fun of you, Father. We, I, we applaud your effort no, to turn we... the filters off. Right. We've made mistakes, uh, uh, too. We had adoration one night going up sideways, and the, it, we've made mistakes, too. We're learning. Yeah, well, I, I did a live read the other day, and I did half of the book sideways. People said, you're sideways, Raymond. I didn't know what they were talking about. Anyway, a few <laughs> priests in Maryland, Father, have started, uh, and we have video of this, um, uh, drive-through confessions, as you mentioned. One in Maine did yeah. the same thing. Um, so this is—it looks like this is a, a new adaptation that's catching on, because people can't uh, uh, take part in the sacrament of confession via Skype or the phone. You've got to be in person. So— uh, it yes. looks like you all are trying to accommodate as best you can. Absolutely. You can't. You have to be in person. And with technology, there's always the danger someone could be listening or recording. So that's why you can't use, like, Skype or FaceTime. But, yeah, parishes all over the country now are doing this. And it's, it's again, it, the technology is a gift. It's really sad that we're separated physically, but people really feel the connection in their homes or online. Mm -hmm. And then having the confessions available to do this this way, it's just awesome. People are really feeling yeah. kind of the pastoral care there. So, yeah. Well, the effort, I think the effort of the clergy is is well taken. And I know here in, in southern Louisiana, priests have been putting the, the Eucharist on the flatbeds of a truck and driving yes. it through whole neighborhoods throughout the parish, which is a great idea. Um, there was a priest in Lebanon who brought the Blessed Sacrament to Beirut, but he did it by flying over the city in, in this plane. helicopter. Yeah. So, so this yeah. is, you know, th these are really innovative ways I think people are. Uh, and you see people in Italy. Here's a priest in Italy blessing homes and businesses yeah. from the, the back of a truck. Um, what have you learned from this experience in connecting with your parishioners in this new way? I've learned, number one, honestly, I was surprised how much I missed seeing everybody. Because at first I thought, oh, it's like a mm. snow day. We'll get a little bit of downtime. We are so busy, but I don't see anybody in person. And then also, too, how, it's so edifying how many people, how everybody yearns for the Eucharist. And they yearn to mm. be in their parish. And it's such a big, in our secular age, I was surprised how much the church is still a part of people's lives. They really miss mm -hmm. it. They're, they're willing to watch a goofy video live streamed because it's from their parish with their priests and their yep. deacons that they know. And really, I, I mean, God is working, you know, he's really working. It's a terrible suffering. It's a very juicy Lent, but God is doing something. Yeah. It's, there's so much good coming out of this. So it's fascinating. Very good. Father Bjorn Lundberg, thank you for your ministry. Of course, if you're near Sacred Heart of Jesus Parish in Winchester, Virginia, I guess you got the drive through confession. How often do you do it, Father? Right now, we do it Wednesday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. and Saturday from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m., but I have a feeling we're going to expand that in the future. Wow. And it's sacredheartwinchester.org. Thank you, Father Bjorn. You're welcome. God bless. Edward Penton is next. But first this. On Wednesday, a Rome newspaper reported that a person who lives in the same residence as Pope Francis has tested positive for coronavirus and is being treated in an Italian hospital. The Vatican had no immediate comment. Francis, who has canceled public appearances and is conducting his general audiences via television, lives at the Santa Marta House. There are currently about 75 people in residence there. The Vatican said on Tuesday that four individuals had so far tested positive inside the city-state, but those it listed do not live in Casa Santa Marta where the 83-year-old pontiff lives. Here with analysis of the is Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register, Edward Penton. Edward, thank you for joining us. Now, you are living through, I know, week three of this nationwide lockdown in Italy. The Italian Prime Minister uh, Giuseppe Conte put even further restrictions on the country last Saturday, closing all Italian businesses. What is it like living in almost warlike conditions in Rome? And explain that document you have to carry around with you to move about. 
Yeah, well, it's very strange, Raymond. I mean, we're basically all under sort of house arrest, and uh, which is a very obviously something people aren't used to, and uh, people aren't uh, going out very much at all, um, and uh, really only for urgent uh, necessities or to go to the supermarket or to the pharmacy. Uh, so it's it's mm-hmm. very restrictive, and this this decree that they put out on uh, a couple of days ago actually makes it makes it even harder to uh, to travel and you actually can't go to different municipalities or different boroughs of the city without taking this wow. this slip of paper uh, and showing that you have the permission to go there either for work or for a medical reason or for some urgent necessity wow uh, edward how is the pope adapting to this lockdown i'm told he's still meeting with people why and is it wise to remain in santa marta when we know or possibly it's been reported that one person might be affected yes well it's, it is a bit uh, strange some people say well you know other world leaders have had to go into isolation and quarantine but uh, <clears throat> he's continuing to meet uh, meet people he said uh, in that interview in uh, in spanish uh, a couple of days ago, that uh, he's meeting people mm-hmm. every every hour, even every half, half hour, he said. Uh, and he met four, four officials today. So he's continuing to meet people and basically continued life as normal. I think he feels quite constrained by this and doesn't like feeling constrained uh, mm-hmm. from doing his work and meeting people. Well, I guess he's practicing social distancing and figures, you know, he'll be okay. But g- given his lung condition, as you know, uh, uh, the the capacity of that one lung, it, it is a concern, I think, to all of us. Uh, Pope Francis led Christians around the world in praying in Our Father to ask God's mercy uh, during this coronavirus pandemic. And tomorrow, he's going to give an extraordinary urbi et orbi blessing, a Latin for to the city and the world, a blessing to the city and the world, in front of an empty St. Peter's Square. Why is he doing this? Um, and, then there, and there is an indulgence attached uh, to this as well. Tell me about all of that. Yes, well, this is this is uh, two uh, special prayer moments that he, he announced on Sunday. The first one was the Our Father with, with Christian communities around the world on, on Wednesday. And this is the second one really for the faithful um, and really to, to give a special prayer uh, for them. And he's going to also bring uh, the miraculous crucifix that he prayed at uh, a few days ago mm-hmm. um, to pray for an end to the to the uh, to the epidemic, and that really is the the, the crux of it. It is to pray uh, for an end to this pandemic, um, and really to pray mm-hmm. for all those who are suffering because of it. Um, and that's mm-hmm. why that's why he's doing it. But this extraordinary orbi et orbi is also very interesting because he usually only gives those at Easter and Christmas, um, and so it underlines again the urgency and the importance of this this uh, pandemic and why it's so important to him and to many people. Edward, you, you referenced this Spanish interview the Pope granted. Uh, he told that same reporter that the COVID-19 pandemic is nature having a fit in response to the Earth's pollution. Here's a clip in Spanish with English subtitles. Curiosamente, hacía mucho tiempo que el planeta no estaba tan limpio. Puede que sea todo esto un ajuste de cuentas de la naturaleza con nosotros. Hay un dicho que seguramente vos lo conocés. Dios perdona siempre. Nosotros perdonamos de vez en cuando. La naturaleza no perdona nunca. Los incendios, las inundaciones, los terremotos. O sea, la naturaleza está pataleando para que nos hagamos cargo del cuidado de la naturaleza. Now, we know the Pope's been focused on climate change, Edward, for some time. Uh, Sarah Ferguson, the, the former Duchess of uh, uh, Kent, took some flack for tweeting something similar. She said, Mother Nature has sent us to our rooms and is taking back control. What's been the reaction to these papal comments? Well, not much surprise, because he said this before. He said before, uh, I can't remember when exactly, but he did give an interview where he said uh, that uh, this, is, this is kind of nature's revenge and that... Uh, that Mother Nature mm. never uh, forgives. So this isn't actually new. But what is interesting is that this is very much uh, based on, on liberation theology. This is very much a thinking from that. And it also fills, in, uh, fills up quite a lot of Laudato Si, his en- encyclical on the environment. And it's really about, um, again, sort of this idea of, of nature's revenge on pollution and, and misusing the environment. Um, and uh, mm. it's, it's also called sort of Gaia's revenge. And it's very much, as I say, a thinking of liberation theology, and uh, certain liberation theologians like Leonardo Boff, um, who was mm. a very uh, famous uh, liberation theologian who 
who was actually sort of very Marxist as well. And this is this is uh, very much part of that thinking. Um, but mm. uh, but yes, it's also it's also a, a kind of departure from the way that the church is often taught about uh, these kind of what what they say are chastisements. And it's usually because of sin and man's sin um, that that right. in the sort of traditional way of thinking. And that the Lord has to intervene because of man's sin, and that's how it happens. And in, in order to sort of bring order out of disorder, so this is this is very much sort of um, a, a, a variance to that, and some would say a departure from it too. Yeah, Edward. Before I let you go, the register. Uh, you have a new piece in the register uh, on Cardinal Joseph Zen. He is still raising alarm. He was on our show a few weeks ago over the pastoral guidelines the Vatican issued to the church in China. Why does he believe these are detrimental to the Chinese faithful? Very quickly. Well, he just feels that they're really basically uh, it's forcing clergy, but uh, the faithful in general in in China to sort of. Sign up to the to the, the schismatic church. At least that's what he says it is. Uh, the, the state-run church in China, and that, of course, has never been allowed in the church before. So he says it's basically forcing them into apostasy. So he says it's a it's a particularly evil document, and in fact, he says it's worse than the the provisional agreement, which was very controversial, signed in 2018 between the Vatican and Beijing. And so he said this is actually far worse than that, um, and it's the worst the worst thing at all. So he's very concerned about that and uh, and really wants it put right, and also the, the agreement itself made public. Yeah, well, I know he and Cardinal Paroline have been at odds, and you attempted to interview both here. Uh, the piece is quite fascinating. You can find that at ncregister.com. Edward Penton, stay safe, and we'll check in with you in the days ahead. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. One of the best things you and your family can do during this time together is go on a literary adventure from home. This week, the paperback edition of Will Wilder 3, The Amulet of Power, hit bookstores and online retailers. Why not order it for home delivery? What better way to have fun and give the gift of literature and sharing each other's experience? I love Will Wilder's entire family goes on this uh, adventure together, and you all can as well. All three Will Wilder books are also available as audiobooks via Kindle. Go to willwilderbooks.com. I'll also be doing a few Facebook live read-alouds uh, of the various books throughout the week. I'll be answering your questions as well. Go to my Facebook and Twitter accounts for details on all of that. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, stay safe, stay together in prayer, and we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from New Orleans. Bye now.